So, welcome back everybody to the monthly EVH webinars. Um, if you're watching the recording, and I know we've got a couple of people here as well live with us, so I'm going to unmute you guys. Looks like Cindy also just arrived, so if you want to say hi, you guys are all unmuted. If you have a lot of background noise, you can either mute yourselves um, or I can mute you either way. So hello, Cindy, James, and Joletta. Can you guys hear me? Yes, hello. Hello, hello. So we were gonna start by opening it up to you guys to see, you know, if you, James, and if you guys have any questions or things you want to discuss or cases or you know places you're stuck james i don't have any so i'm pretty new i've only been a member for about four months i'm looking forward to hopefully taking the next pivh course right now i'm mainly doing just acute stuff in the clinic and trying to learn as much as i can so i'm not really taking on much in the way of chronic cases so, but I've enjoyed the last few months just learning from you all and, and listening. I love, love this uh, webinar every month. So, um, hopefully, eventually, I'll be taking on some chronic stuff and, and working my way through that. But for now, it's been mainly acute. So, I don't really have anything offhand. So, James, we, met, we met right in, in yes, um, Florida. Right. Yeah. yeah, how are you doing? Yeah. Good. Good. It's nice to see you. It was good to yeah, see you guys yeah. that I saw when when I was in uh, when I was in Florida at the at the holistic that meeting. Oh, was that? Yeah. So I was gonna say if you remember all the way back to you know uh, Tampa when EVH was there. Um, that's a darn good memory, but you you were no to no. This that. was uh, yeah. This was yeah. Um, Kissimmee just this last weekend. Got it. And Lisa, you joined us after um, we pretty much just opened up the mic and asked you guys, you know, if there is there any cases or other topics that you want to uh, discuss in this more study group kind of kind of environment before we go forward. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Well, I'm always always interested in um, any successful cancer cases. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you? How are you measuring success when we're talking about six, a successful cases, but specifically successful cancer cases? Outliving the prognosis. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not thinking about cure necessarily. Mm -hmm. And and you're fi you're finding that the cases that you see do or don't outlive the prognosis which really means nothing but uh, I know it really depends on on what you're talking about I mean I treated a, a, a 18 year old cat that had lost half of her tongue to squamous cell carcinoma probably shouldn't have lived more than a few days and she lived for like a month and a half I mean she lost it surgically or she oh the, no the she, tumor eroded or, yeah. or it was surgically protected no no yeah the, the cat was very difficult to allow oral examination, not not because of biting, but just because of pain. And she also had a bunch of resorptive lesions. So every time somebody looked in her mouth, they said, oh, the resorptive lesions are causing the pain, including the first time I saw her. Um, you know, that that's what I naturally thought. And I didn't really force her to open her mouth. Um, but the second time I saw her, I did force her to open her mouth. And that was when I realized she was missing half of her tongue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So what, what kind of uh, what kind of remedy did you uh, did you get that that uh, uh, response with? Lachesis. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, um, I looked in Murphy's and saw gangrene of the tongue. I said, "Oh my God, that's exactly what this cat has." And I mean, it, it didn't cure her. I didn't expect it to, but it got her to the point where the, the client was syringe feeding her, where she wasn't rejecting the syringe feedings. So she was mm -hmm. able to hang on for a little mm -hmm. while longer. And mm -hmm. was that one, one dose, uh, multiple doses, so 30? Um, I think she had a total of two or three doses of 30C. 
about maybe like two or three weeks apart. And was she having any kind of immediate response within a couple of days in any of her, you know, uh, vitality symptoms, you know, behavior, energy, appetite, mood? She actually had a kind of unusual, what I consider counteraction after the first dose. Um, mom said she acted kind of wide eyed and, and, um, not really frantic, but she had, she almost had like, like, like approving of some of the mental symptoms the first, after the first dose. Um, I have to look in my Murphy's, but. You and know, do, it, it, do you know the, do, or do, do you recall what the timing of this symptoms were? Was it right away or a couple of days or? It, it was the first day. It was, uh, it was, do you yeah, think it was, it was late, a, later that night. Do you think it was a medicinal aggravation? Right. I mean, was that a lack of symptom, or yeah. or do you think that that was a clarification of 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 the the remedy that might you know that might indicate what the next prescription is? Yeah. I I, I thought it was a lack of symptom. I mean, I mean, because I I you know when I found out delusions and hallucinations. I mean that that sounds exactly like what she described it seemed like the cat was experiencing so and so, what was so, the dose that you gave do you know 30c that was all that i had uh dry you gave dry, it, dry yeah, just, you gave it dry. <clears throat> yep just yep. dry yep and i had i think i had her only give me maybe, maybe two pellets we don't yeah. so so retrospectively what, what would you say that 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 as you term it, that unusual counteraction. What would you? What What would your assessment of that be? Uh, I, I, in my mind, I thought it sort of solidified that I had the right remedy. Maybe in hindsight, it would have been better to go with a lower potency. But she she described the exact behavior that it sounds like, you know, with lachesis. Did you see that after the second dose? No, we did not see it after successive doses. It's, did it's you interesting. Did you the remedy or did you keep giving just the dry 30C? It was dry we, we just, um, Well, actually, she, what, what she was doing, I, 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 it wasn't given dry. She would dissolve a couple of pellets in a little bit of water. And um, I'm still a little new at this, guys, so I probably should be having clients count pellets um do, do you guys um, i tend to favor the smaller pellets so like number 10 pellets which are obviously harder to count i mean do you guys all use the big globules so that you can know how many pellets or what's what's the consensus i i like the, I said, the small pellets too because they're hard to spit out but i don't count yeah them. i said okay i send them out wet so so the client will get a the client will either get a medicinal solution or they'll get, depending on where I'm shipping to, or they'll get mm -hmm. a single pellet, rarely two, in a in mm -hmm. a dropper bottle, and then they'll add the diluent when when the when the package arrives is at their house. So I don't I don't have clients counting pellets or doing anything like that. It's it's always in uh it's always in wet dose if it if it goes out of you know, if it's dispensed. On the rare occasion that I have uh, folks mixing up a remedy at their place um, for whatever unusual circumstance, then I just have them, ha you know, do one do one pellet. My my stock, my remedy stock, is all in the in the little tiny poppy seed size pellets, but those pellets are relatively rare uh, to get if you're you know if you're going to the store and buying them or or whatever. You know, most of those are in the larger pellets. Yeah, those are the number, I number forties, the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we really do underestimate the, um, you know, the 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 actual power of you know one pellet, three pellets, six pellets, so however many pellets that you know that we that we tip in into things. And I think um, I think Liza, if you you know as you start to continue to uh, hone that craft of of looking at starting to do uh liquid dosing you're going to really find that the number of pellets really makes an influence 
first of all, to dry to the liquid, you're probably going to find uh, you're going to find a difference, but also the number of pellets and and how you handle that solution. You may have been able to um, to amend that solution by dissolving it in a larger amount of water and giving mm -hmm. the cat less of that dissolved medicinal solution, or you may have been able to uh, take that that original dissolving uh, dissolved solution into a, another cup and and diluting it even even further to try you want to you know try and reduce that medicinal aggravation yeah i mean it wasn't horrible and it lasted for maybe an hour or two um but yeah horrible's horrible yeah. relative I, I mean horrible's relative and and we do know that these most of these individuals who've got themselves with a cancer label diagnosis have got a pretty uh have got a pretty um um uncoordinated if you will vitality you know and and the other thing is that we you know we don't know that we don't know what was going on on inside the cat's head so so you know if you read some of the mental and emotional uh symptoms of of lachesis if you know if she's wide-eyed and frantic and delusions and hallucinations who knows what that cat might have been experiencing at that time you know yeah. Well, actually, another area where I've actually struggled a little bit, although I've also had some successes with skin cases, I'm sure that's the bane of everybody's existence, but do they get easier as I go along, or do you guys still sometimes struggle with these tough skin aller aller allergic animals? Sometimes, yeah, I kind of moved away from thinking of allergies um, because, I don't know, the, the labels don't really matter and we can get really attached to them. But um, yeah, I agree. A lot of times, so many of the skin stuff that I see is diet related and very, very often if there's after the diet straightened out and there's still skin issues the you know the remedies just bring it right all right along so. that's what that's what i find that's what i find too is is it's it's pretty uh it's pretty not fruitless but but we see so many cases where we're seeing artificial disease from errors in diet and supplement, um, or we're seeing uh, spot on flea control, or we're seeing household chemicals or, um, uh, you know, different products that are being used in the, in the home that are making a, that are making a significant difference and getting these guys, you know, on a more species appropriate diet, looking at some of the, uh, looking at some of the things that tend to be, you know, trouble listed things like some of the grains, the glyphosate mediated stuff, those kinds of things. Um, uh, getting getting into, I rarely use single antigen diets and and that sort of stuff. I do have situations where I'll do an exclusion trial sometimes, um, and 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 you know see where things go that way. But I I really find uh, skin type cases really difficult to manage unless folks are, are making the changes to the diet. There's a lot of them that that um, don't want to have uh, raw food either. And that's one of the things, you know, when we look at sort of from the traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, a lot of these, a lot of these um, skin cases have, have got really interesting spleen chi things happening with them. And, and we know that spleens don't like to be cold and they don't like to be damp and they like to be you know warm and dry and and sometimes just feeding these guys you know cold wet food is 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 difficult as well so i usually um uh, especially those kind of moist damp skins uh, a lot of times i'll have the folks you know make sure they're they're warming the food not feeding it out of the fridge and and cooking it lightly and that and that seems to make a difference and and so often, you know, we'll see symptoms, you know, stuff will change. Sometimes we'll get a lessening of the symptoms. Sometimes we'll get a modality shows up. And I, I often don't even prescribe for those skin cases until, uh, you know, until they've had a dietary change for four to six weeks. Then the other thing that I, I'll do is, is do some bathing um, with a non-medicated shampoo. Um, and sometimes you'll certainly get a modality <laughs> out of that. 
um, and sometimes you can get them some some relief as well. Um, with that. Um, so, Sue, are you saying that you will alter the diet based on TCVM um, characteristics? Or I'll, I, I, I don't do that as much as some of my colleagues. You know, certainly Cindy would be a great person to talk to about that. Um, you know, but but I do know that that I've seen over the years that a lot of these guys do not do as well. Some of them do great. But but a lot of them that don't do as well on that sort of cold raw diet as they do on a lightly cooked, slightly warmer diet, and I think that's got a lot to do with the where this where their spleen cheese sitting. You there, Cindy? Are you multitasking? Um, Hi, Sue. Yeah, I am multitasking. Sorry, I had a down horse I was talking to, so I only heard my name mentioned in the ethers we were just, we were just talking about um looking at some of these skin cases from the tcvm perspective and i was saying that a lot of them sp seem to have spleen chi weaknesses and they don't do really well on cold raw wet diets and they like to have a little bit of cooked or a little bit of warmth in their in their diet above and beyond just changing the diet from you know whatever commercial stuff and jeff asked me am i managing cases from a from a uh traditional Chinese diagnosis and I tend not to do that although I tend to sometimes have it in the back of my head but yeah well think. you know what a mongrel I am but yeah for sure yeah um they're they can't digest their food well and then they've got no. leaky gut and then they've got all the their livers are overwhelmed from all the garbage and then yeah. they have retained pathogens so I I tell everyone to lightly cook their food the meat or the veggies crap out because they don't have the energy to digest. They can't digest any of the cellulose. So yeah, I, I like them feeding warmed warmed food and well cooked veggies and and I yeah. do like using oatmeal and and rice. You know the whole pea flour thing is a big issue and there is a malabsorption from all the pea flour that they're using. Um, without soaking that, you know, that outer crap out, yeah. these are fine. So, so it really is a real issue. So yeah, it's it's a big problem. Yeah, and I think I think most these tough skin cases, unless we can work around them with the the diet and some of those obstacles to to both cure for the energy of you know getting the animal to be able to you know, to gather up enough vitality to respond, but uh, but also for obstacles to clear expression of the symptom picture. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to chase remedies around uh, for stuff that's actually, a, you know, an error in, in diet or supplement or whatever. Yeah. Yep, yeah. completely agree. And Lisa, um, I, f I find that some do get easier, some don't, but it's really, really important regardless to have the client set their expectations or set their expectations with them when you first, you know, talk to them. Because um, a lot of people that that I've seen, you know, kind of expect homeopathy to be a, a miracle after, you know, one or two remedies or one or two months, even though they've been struggling, you know, with for meds for months and months and sometimes years and years. Mm -hmm. the, the other, yeah, the other thing that, that you know, uh, you, all those other obstacles and, and, and uh, uh, mitigating factors, the other thing that really has helped me over the years with skin stuff is just back to that whole conversation that we had earlier about posology. How do we present the remedy? At what interval do we present the remedy? And and um, you know, wet versus dry. So you're you're minimizing medicinal aggravations, uh, and yeah. you're fine tuning a, a slow. It doesn't necessarily have to be a low potency, slow repeated dose, but but that you're that you you're keeping things consistently under the influence. The other the other thing that really is helpful is uh well two things to think about one is to try and elicit the symptoms from the 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 client you know what was this like when it first started not what is it like now because they're all bald red and itchy um but but what was it like 
when it first started because that's often the truer voice of the of the naturally occurring disease and then also coaching people about you know they're itching all the time well they're itching all the time like do they are they itching at night do they sleep yeah, do they play yeah. and 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 that whole thing about realizing that one of the first things that we'll see when we get these guys on an appropriate model or on an appropriate remedy is that we start to develop modalities that might not have been there so, so we start to see a time of day or a circumstance or something that makes them the itch less or the whole animal feel better or feel worse. And, and, and unless we're carefully questioning our clients and unless we're coaching them to say, hey, these are the kinds of things that you may see, um, you know, like where on the body are they itching? How easily can they be distracted? The bathing part for me is, is really a useful thing. You know, if you get them on an oatmeal bath twice a week, uh, can you tell that, the, that they're ready to be bathed? You know, if they're being bathed on Saturday and Wednesday, you know, are, are they ready for a bath on Monday? Are they ready for a bath on Tuesday? Are they ready for a bath on Wednesday morning? Um, so you, you can start to see those kinds of shifts, too, which which if you're if you're using the itching, not itching yardstick, um, you're not going to you're not going to see them. Um, right. So, yeah. It, yeah. So it's a subtle transition um, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And all these we've um, we've emailed about this a little bit, but, you know, what we're doing with holistic actions uh, with with animal guardians is training them to be on lookout exactly, you know, know what to look for, know what to expect, um, and training your clients, even getting them to get a cancer, or, you know, know what a modality is, and I'll look for any modification or any general symptom. It's really, really, really important with the, any kind of end stage pathology or skin case. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I think Gilletta had some shows. And, and 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 you also gotta you also gotta just get really brave about you know no vaccinations. Uh, you, you got to deal mm. with the rabies police waltz, uh, mm. no spot on flea control, mm. uh, no, you know, no super medicinal, holy moly shampoos, no other modality, not necessarily no other modalities. I'm not going to say that because I know some hands that 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 there are multiple modalities that that are applied beautifully together but but we need to we just need to recognize that those long standing you know tired skin cases are long tired long standing tired skin cases you know and so we've got to look at you know the gut and the and the and the appropriate microbiome we've got to look at environmental toxins we've got to look at all all of those kinds of things uh, water is another thing that really makes a big difference, and and uh, I see a lot of cases where water can be a can be a huge uh, uh, obstacle, both to to cure and to presentation of symptoms. What, what, something in the water, or yeah, quality of the water, purity of the water, contaminants in the water, um, uh, electrical conductivity in the water, uh, water that's being softened uh, can of often be an issue. Uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, because of the because of the lack of appropriate electrical conductivity in the water. We have a lot of animals and humans too that are drinking, but they're really dehydrated be because there's not any uh, spark, if you will, in the water. Um, and, 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 you know, things are not, they're not absorbing in, in the cells and, and balancing things out that way. So how, how, how do you come to that conclusion? Do you say, give them bottled water for right, a week? What, or what, what do, do you do? do? Yeah. Well, so, yeah, it depends on the situation. I, I tend to ask a lot of questions about water. And I mean, some of that is from my personal bias. Some of it is because I work a lot with livestock. Some of it is for a lot of reasons, but, but, but I ask them, what kind of water do they, do they use? Uh, I ask them about, you know, have they had their water tested uh, or I'll, a lot of times they'll go and look and, you know, if they're on city water, um, most of the city water places have got a water report <clears throat> that you can look at and get the basic kind of stuff. If they're on rural water, uh, we know that there's some geographical issues with, with rural water. If they're on water that's being softened, you know, I've got a water softener or water conditioner in my house. A lot of times those, those can, uh, th there can be a lot of issues with that. Um, dental tartar actually is one of the ones, kind of that frothy, um, 
that frothy pumice stone looking dental carter uh, I see in a disproportionate um, amount of animals that are that are on uh, on city water that's being run through a softener. So what what kind of water do you recommend to um uh, reverse osmosis bottled um yeah, um, and, and I, I actually have done some work over the years with the guys from Personova who have a really interesting, uh, they have a, a several different water purification <laughs> systems for individual, like for individual, you know, here's a bowl of it, let's, let's, um, let's, uh, let's treat that bowl for, or, or for, you know, under your kitchen sink kind of units to whole house units that's that actually uh they they do two things they clean up the water uh you know and remove the the toxins and stuff in it but they also um enhance the vitality of the water so that it 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 looks at how the the bond angles between the hydrogen and the oxygen are are um oscillating what what um what um, amplitude through which they're oscillating and that actually has that water uh, um, behaving more biologically appropriately it's quite a it's quite amazing i was a little skeptical when we first started talking about it but it's it's really truly amazing to see uh to see the differences and and it's i was just talking about this to somebody uh the other day it's really hard to see you know with an individual animal in a house like a pet um we really see phenomenal differences when we start looking at water quality in agricultural situations. So if we have a, a hog barn or a chicken house or something like that, where we clean up the water and start seeing conversion rates that improve by 30%, we start seeing death rates that go down by multiple, you know, double digit percentages. We start seeing rates of gains that go up by, by, by double digit um pounds per animal you know we're looking at you know hogs through um through weaning um and they're using less antibiotics we actually see it too on the field where they're actually able to mix if they were to mix agrochemicals at the label dose they burn the crops down they have to knock it down um uh, 40 to 60 percent of the label dose be because the water is um being absorbed more you know it's carrying things and it's being absorbed into the plants and the animals uh, more fully. So, so, you know, one, even the guys that are doing confinement barns, I was talking to a confinement hog guy that's, that's using, you know, 30 to 40%, um, his, he, he's, he's using 30 to 40% of the antibiotics that he used to use before he changed the water, you know, so you, and, and again, how do you measure that when, you know, when you're dealing with Fido and Ralph and Fifi in your house, you know, people don't think about food conversions and, you know, they're doing better on less food and, and drinking more water and, you know, and even the water behaves differently in these barns. You know, if you put them through the, if you put them through the uh, watering system and they're, a lot of them drink out of little nipples. And if you take the nipple off on the untreated water, the water kind of pees out about two to three feet. And you take the nipple off on the on the side where the, you know, the as as the farmers call it, you know, the activated water, it'll go out 20, 30 feet. And and so the animals are drinking hog barns will drink, you know, 30,000 gallons more water a turn um, in in these, you know, in when we when we've got uh, appropriate water presented to them. We don't. It's hard to measure that. In, in, I'm waving my hands in my air, but it's hard to measure that in pets, it, you know, um, the, the same way that we can measure it in agricultural situations sometimes. But it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. And we, when we look at the, you know, the nutrition that we use, you know, air is the most important. You're not going to live very long without it. Um, but water is actually even more important than food. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm sorry, so I may have missed it. Do they make a home unit for making yep. you know, water? Yep. Yep. They make home units. Uh, they tend to be they tend to be individualized. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm going to say mix and match, but they can be individualized for the situation. You know, depending on um, depending on what you've got. You know, I've worked with a dairy farm in in. Um, Pennsylvania that has really high uranium levels, for example. So, you know, they specific they specifically, um, you know, uh, built a unit that that helped with that. 
but antibiotic residues, drug residues, uh, uh, different chemical residues, uh, agrochemicals, glyphosate, uh, biological stuff happening. Uh, sometimes it's in, it's in, they install it in conjunction with a reverse osmosis system, but not always. It's, it's quite a, it's a, it's a very interesting system and having, you know, in the ag end, we tend to work with a lot of water systems. Uh, you know, it's much more common to work with water systems than it is in the pet end. Um, but it, and of all the ones I've seen over the years, this one is really, really shines. And did you have an address or a name for the company or web per, address? Personova. Personova is the company. Personova. Okay. P U R S A N O V A dot com. Okay. okay, thank you. And he's actually got some stuff on on YouTube. He's he's a, he actually was trained as a medical doctor and then went to do a he's a quantum physicist actually. Vachi Vachi Kaptegian is his name. Susan. Sanrietta. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Do you think that um, he would be interested in speaking at one of our ABA, ABH conferences? Sure. I can ask him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I could ask him about, you know, a webinar or about an in-person thing, certainly. Well, it, it, you know, we might start on a webinar. It's a small group. But then um, maybe think about something for a larger group. And just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can certainly communicate with him about that. Yeah, that'd be great. Super. Good day. And he's really interested in, he's, he's real. I mean, he's interested in a lot of things, but he's really interested in, in agricultural stuff. He's doing some very interesting stuff. Um, he's got a, he had a visit not that long ago from the World Health Organization because he's got a system where he's building hydrogen peroxide based on his activated water. And then they're, I, I don't even know what the term is, but micro nebulizing it and putting it out uh, through the air conditioning type vents. And they're using it in the, in the places where they've had, um, um, Legionnaire's disease and they can't get it cleaned up and he so so they're putting it into um, They're putting it into buildings and facilities that have been contaminated with with Legionella and and using that to you know to 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 clean up the bacterial issues um, and and also using it in uh, uh, Mostly in confinement barns uh, for reducing airborne pathogens and that sort of stuff. They, he's got two systems. One, one that works uh, when when the place is vacated, where there's no humans or animals in it, and the other, uh, he's designed that's okay. If, you know, if there's animals in the system. I think it's got really great application in places like surgical suites and um, meat processing plants, and and maybe even like milk houses and stuff. You know, that that would be a, a total surface decontamination with a really non-toxic, you know, basically super nebulized, um, really tiny, tiny, tiny droplet size uh, activated hydrogen peroxide. It's quite fascinating. So. so can you guys see my screen? I didn't know what people are saying. Sue, can you see uh, my screen? I just need to close a couple of things and see if I can see your screen. I have a very stacked up desk. Nope. Hmm. What, what, a, what is the webinar show? It says AVH 2018 study group, waiting to view Jeff Feynman's screen. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. We're, we're doing fine. So never mind. Uh, Joletta had a question or comment about, you know, I'm not sure, was it skin or water? Um, but Joletta's trying to speak and not, we're not hearing her even though the system says, and it says that she's muted. But, um, Jolita, I think you can unmute yourself, but I'll see if this works. Okay, can, can you hear me now? We can. There she is. Wow, good. Yay. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, 
the question actually it was a comment way back um even on the one that was talking about the cancer of the tongue at the time and i know it's mm. hard on some of these cases when they have mouth issues especially in cats for you to be able to look in their mouth really well initially were there any modalities or anything that led you to the lachesis or was it just more from knowing knowing the remedy and the gangrene <laughs> appearance was that basically most of it and oh i i just saw a screen come up yeah yeah we could see we see your screen now uh yeah. per, person yep. person over yep. there yep okay great so anyway so when, that was my question so so to answer your question i actually was initially considering going with arsenicum i think lachesis came up maybe fourth or fifth in my analysis and arsenicum was either first or second. Mm -hmm. And I know arsenicum is a very good cancer remedy. But again, you know, with my inexperience, I said, let me just look up lachesis because I remember Richard saying that animal remedies are very good for these really destructive kinds of things. And when I saw gangrene of the tongue, I just said, oh, that's it. And, mm. and that's what I went with. Okay. Okay. And after you gave it, I know it sounded like I was I was so focused on trying to get my audio working, I might have missed a couple things. Sorry. It sounded like you repeated the remedy, and of course she was doing it in water. But um, and I don't know if you were just continuing it as long as that you were seeing a little teeny bit of improvement, and you just continued it that way uh, by that guideline, um, or how how you did it. But did any modalities ever show up that were looking like? You were on the right mode besides that aggravation that you were talking about. I'm gonna have to look at the modalities for lack of this. Um, you know, like worse, I, yeah. worse upon awakening, and I don't, I don't, I can't say that any really did. Okay. Okay. Um, I was just curious. One of the other remedies to think hard about um, in those ulcerative lesions, particularly ulcerative oral lesions, whether it's ulceration of the gums, ulceration of the teeth, if, if you will, with the, the neck lesions and the caries and stuff, and, and uh, um, also ulceration of the other tissue in the mouth is mercurious. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, there's certainly other remedies out there, but, but it, it, it's, it's definitely one. Thanks, Jeff, for putting that up. Yeah, I've used Mercurius successfully in one of my cats that had resorptive lesions. Yeah, and I, I've used Mercurius um, uh, successfully in some uh, oral tumors, and and you know certainly we know it well in oral tumors in humans. You know some squamous cells secondary to uh, tobacco use and 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 that sort of stuff. Um, the other the other I had a really nice uh, squamous cell carcinoma in a in a dog, some of you have heard me talk about this case, that lachesis and um, lachesis and our, or excuse me, phosphorus and arsenicum with a uh, three year plus survival rate. Well, that was a squamous cell carcinoma case, Sue, Susan? It was a squamous cell carcinoma of the, um, the soft palate actually was where the initial lesion was and and the dog actually shoved the mass laterally bumped out one of the molars and then uh and then the mass moved anteriorly ended up underneath the filth room in the in the dog's nose um leaving perfectly normal tissue behind and in the in wow. the interim lost its fear of thunderstorms and loud noises and uh quit having epileptic seizures it, it was really a wow, sweet wow. uh really a sweet wow. case yeah one yeah, wonderful case. wonderful were, were you yeah. dosing dosing with the uh uh method in the fifth, so, fifth edition of the organon with the liquid dosing? i was doing six i was doing sixth organon do, i mean it, it went in liquid but but it went at pretty long interval. Um, as I say, that the dog was euthanized three years and something after it was presented, and and that was because it had this, um, it had this, um, you know, knob size. It wasn't a real huge mass. It was maybe as big as a couple of garbanzo beans right underneath its nose. And the clients had 2,600 square feet of white carpet. And the dog would get really excited about eating and would snuffle around in its bowl and would bleed on the white carpet. And they, you know, they thought three years 
in a dog that was supposed to be dead in six weeks was pretty good. So, so, oh, so actually yeah. they euthanized the dog because of that management issue, not because mm. of the cancerous affections. Sure. Mm. It was pretty, it was pretty sweet. I mean, if to have that case back now, I think I probably would have pushed it a little harder, uh, a little harder with timing of the dose, Gilletta, mm -hmm. you know, with those liquid doses a little more frequently um, to see if we could have, you know, could have got that thing to roll off its face. Sure, sure. I know. It I'm listening. Pretty, it was pretty amazing. What, yeah. and, and listening to Kim, Kim Alia and his his webinars and his dosing and doing it frequently, as long as you're seeing, you know, a little bit of improvement, it, it's right. incredible how frequently he's he's dosing these right. cases. And I'm thinking, right. wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I know I know that from my own from my own personal care um, and have have gone through. I mean, I've had situations where I've had a single dose of dry, uh, you know, give seven months of really clear response. And, and I've had other times, uh, you know, throughout my care where, you know, using a moderate potency, uh, wet, you know, every day or multiple times a day or every other day. So I, I think we we really got the potential for for um, fine tuning this, you know, on the patient's needs. You know, if we're seeing response, clear response, we don't need to bump them again, but we right. need to, you know, learn how to maintain that momentum of the response and differentiate that from being impatient and saying, by God, I want it fixed by Thursday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Andre has found, and Judy, you may want to comment as well, about Andre's pathology, because he's found that cancer and you know, ALS and some uh, other neurologic more serious diseases need really frequent uh, dosing, just like suicide, you know, keeping him under the influence, but he'll do it with you know, uh, 10 amps or C amps or higher. Um, as often as a couple times a day, if needed, based on the response. And that's, right. I guess, always the key is, you know, um, if needed. And, you know, and I, 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 I can remember talking to uh, Ramakrishnan about a cancer case way back in the day. When he, used to, he used to come to Pennsylvania, and there'd be a real small group of us meet. And he had a kid that uh, came to him. His, his father carried this child on his back for two days across the mountains until they got to a friend's place and they borrowed a donkey for another couple of days. And they put the kid on a donkey and took him to this big clinic that, the, you know, he was there. One of those things, you know, like there's hundreds of people in the room or in the yard. And, and, and he, he, he gave a single dose of silica 200 C to a kid who had a essentially an osteosarcoma of the um, of the um, tibia right at the knee and and you know they dad put him back on the donkey and off they went again and and months later talked to those those people and you know that the child was pain free he was walking the big mass went away and you know things things were well and then had had a couple year follow up on the on the kid but you know again it's hard when you're you know, three days donkey and two days hiking <laughs> away. And that was a, and that was wow. a really sweet case, you know, and I, it was a really sweet case for a lot of reasons, but it was also a really sweet case because, you know, a lot of people really, I think, misinterpret Ramakrishna's work, you know, doing the multi-remedies and the, and the rote posology and the alternating and all of that sort of stuff. He's got a nice protocol. He's got an interesting protocol for repeating doses at interval, you know, and and kind of pulse dosing but he certainly he certainly does single remedy uh prescribing very very effectively so not all of his successful you know prescriptions are the alternating dose that he's often misinterpreted for any any other questions um cindy elisa henry james Joletta, we just talked to Noel, Rosie. Um, any any other questions for us to discuss? I don't have any questions. It's just interesting to hear all you guys talk. I I I, ha I have another question. How many people in these some of these um, cases where you have these really bad dentals, okay, and cats that you really don't want to put them under anesthesia, okay? How, I mean, and they're eating. So have you been successful? You're seeing what looks to be a good response and a remedy. 
and you're repeating it in liquid dosing, okay, as according to the response, if you know there's getting some gradual improvement. How many of them have you seen where, you know, like the tartar actually then starts to really come off the teeth and the gums start to feel yep. and look better? Uh, you know, and how yep. long, what kind of response are you getting? Because it's, it's frustrating because I know, of course, around here, you know, if, uh, um, we have one uh, veterinarian in town that does a lot of the dental work. And, of course, she wants to remove all the teeth. And I'm like, no, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to wait it out. So how long time frame have some of these gone on and on? I mean, as long as they're eating and, you know, having. I see a lot of, I see a lot of. I see two things happen, Joletta. I see okay. a lot of times we actually see exteriorization of the symptoms into the mouth. And okay. then, you know, so you read a history and you'll see it a lot, eh? You read a lot of these histories and they're presented for homeopathic care and, you know, boo, 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 six, eight month follow up, four month follow up, whatever. And there's a note in there that they had a dental. And, and a lot of times <laughs> when we start looking at this, they, the, the, actually the oral symptoms are an exteriorization of, of deeper deeper symptomatology that gets out in their mouth and and we know cats have got that predilection to put stuff in their mouth yes. anyway um, yeah and and so I try not to interfere as much as possible mm -hmm. um, uh, if the client is really twitchy and 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 you sort of got to do something give them something to do to distract not to distract them but 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 give them something to do so that they feel like that. I may use some I may use some supplement with them, you know, some coenzyme Q10 or or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but I try as much as possible not to uh, fuss with stuff that's happening in the mouth, particularly when we see changes with it in response to uh, response to remedy. And I okay. see a lot of these a lot of these cases just move they may lose a tooth uh i see it in humans you know where they may throw out a bad uh, a, a bad um a bad um root canal or mm -hmm. or or you know shove off a crown or something like that but but when we look at the overall oral hygiene it it it's it's much better and i try hard not to interfere with them and i see a lot of cases where we 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 kind of um adulterate the response to remedy by getting overly enthusiastic in the dental suite. Well, exactly. That's my bias. Right. Well, yeah. And I know in some of these cases like I've done years ago where I thought, went ahead and let them go have a dental. And then the next thing you know, the cat's going downhill like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah, okay. Exactly. And you're, you're like, Oh, they had a much better life before. Now mm -hmm. how, yeah. you've got the damage. And I, see, I mean, I've seen big hunks of tartar and shit, you know, like that frothy tartar, and even the not so frothy stuff fall off and you see the, you see those sloppy teeth tighten up and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So I don't get very excited about, about chasing them down. I know, I think yeah. Stephanie had some interesting teeth cases. Um, and, and before um, Stephanie comments though, uh, tell her to, what is the, is it the appearance that they don't like, that the um, guardians don't like or? Well, a lot of times it's because they've been to somebody else and they're saying they've mm. got to come out they've got to mm. come out and then what they don't like is that it's going to take yeah. time and they're going to continue yeah. to really think oh no they can't go on like this and when you're saying well, yeah. well, well wait you know, if, we get, if we get a remedy and they're starting to do well and they're eating that's the big thing right so but it, I, I can't tell you how many times i'll have clients where we've given the first remedy and they're getting a slight response and we it's too quick to say okay do we need a different remedy or not but they they panic and then they go have that dental done they like i i can't deal with this so it's <laughs> i mean it's, i know we're talking about one year old kitties or well, ten well, year old or six well one? one of them was um two years old yeah it was only a two-year-old cat and i thought oh my gosh you can't I think one of the one of the things we have to remember with these cats, and you know, it's interesting because there's been a lot of discussion on this um, on the on the um, institute list recently. That um, you know, for the current students, but one of the things we have to remember with a lot of these cats that are getting fish-based food or spray on yummy stuff built with fish or whatever is that they they've they've got mercury, mercury toxicity mm -hmm. and and we're you know we're seeing i mean just read mercurius in the mouth yes. 
And, yes. and those are the symptoms that we're seeing. And so, you know, part of it is how do we stop that coming into these cats? And then secondly is how do we manage that in these cats that, mm. that are, you know, that are suffering from mercury toxicity. And, and, you know, so do we, do we, you know, manage them homeopathically? Uh, do we use other mercury uh, purification kinds of things? You know, do we, do we use a, uh, uh, um, you know, a solubilis instead of a, uh, you know, vivis or a vivis instead of a solubilis or something like that in our treatment as well. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those, I think a lot of those mouth things that we see particular, I mean, we've got really sick young cats, certainly, but it's just like that skin conversation that we had, you know, earlier is I think a lot of those symptoms are artificial disease that are, that are, you know, being exacerbated by the diet. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. And plus, when you you hit upon the different waters, yeah, that's that's a big thing, especially if people are using water that's just completely has no minerals in it. Like, um, yeah, it's really dead, or pink. they're running it through the softeners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was so that what and, you mean by? And they're like, and they're too sick. They're too sick to exteriorize to the skin. So they exteriorize to the mouth and they exteriorize to the bowel. So, so you look at, you know, you might have a cat that's had a long history of, you know, label diagnosis, irritable bowel syndrome or whatever that thing is. And we look at, you know, where is that in the body? It's relatively healthier to have your irritable bowel syndrome settle down and to have mouth symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But somehow I don't understand it. We, you know, we profession as a profession tend to think about dentistry as totally detached from the rest of the animal. Why not? <laughs> well, what, oh, what do you, what do you mean? You mean us as homeopaths, or you mean uh, the conventional? Because uh, isn't it just another way of reducing the body into parts? Yeah, I agree. I agree, and I think. I think, you know, in the homeopathic community, I think, I think we tend to, uh, we tend to forget that, you know, um, we, we think about, oh, like they make a discharge in the ear and we might not use a typically medicated ear stuff or they, they throw on a lumpy body thing and we tend to not to get too, you know, we might hesitate to just be lopping and chopping, but they get a, they get something in their mouth and all, all of a sudden they're off for dental, you know, it's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm. Oh well, yeah, or sometimes the clients will go ahead and do that, and then they they tell you weeks later, you know, because they don't want to let yeah. you know. I've had that happen too. And I had a, I had a dog presented to me once. It was a standard poodle, presented to me with a a mouth a mouth of a mouthful of really kind of mercurious looking teeth. It had uh, a lot. I mean, you know what it looks like if if I say that. And, and, you know, drooly and uh, dirty flus and um, uh, purulent discharge and receding gums and some ulceration of the, of the mouth that had actually been biopsied and had been fine. And we had this long conversation. This is the first visit of the client had ever come. We had this long conversation about what would I do with the dog? And I told them what I would do with the dog. And they said that was fine. And the lady of the family was kind of... Uh, uh, she was kind of an interesting lady and she didn't think the dog looked good or smelled good or whatever. And they, so they took it to a conventional veterinarian, had a dental done, had two extractions done. And three weeks later, the dog was back in my office with a squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue, mm. which I know, I know was not there. And I know the guy who did the dental and I, you know, cause he, and he biopsied some of the gums, not, it was not there. <laughs> And, and and like I say, back in my office in under a month with a squamous cell carcinoma of the of the distal portion of the tongue, and that dog vacillated between mercurious and phosphorus, and mercurious and phosphorus, and and um, you know there's a whole lot of other circumstances with it. But but I think that we underestimate how manipulative dental, you know, simple dental procedures can be in these animals that are so disorganized. Exactly. Although one of the hard parts in in monitoring the progress in the mouth of a cat is the cooperative level of the cat. That's mm -hmm. what's frustrating because, okay, you think, all right, the client's telling you, all right, it's eating, 
you know, it's coming around more again now, being a little more social, a little slowly, little by little, but yet it's not like you can look in that cat's mouth every other day because they just exactly so So, and and, you know it's helpful though i mean cell phones make things really helpful because sometimes we can get pictures and stuff that can be helpful and and you know the ability of even the client to look in the cat's mouth if we show them how you know they don't have that (laughs) get open like it's a big lion mouth but you know just to flip the lip and look a little bit and the cat's cooperation with that is going to be an indicator of the the response to the remedy too eh? Right, right, because if they definitely don't let you open the mouth at all, you know, well, okay, <laughs> I don't think you're making progress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're, really they're, cured, they're cured and they're still hard to medicate. <laughs> oh, I can look really quickly at a hissed off cat. I can just look at the mouth while it's hissing. And the, yeah. the more angry it is, the longer the mouth stays open. And you yeah. don't even touch the cat. Yeah, yeah right. That, that's a good way to take advantage of that situation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Taunt the kitty. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. Just being there taunts it enough a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Worst, yeah. I mean, I Always practical, Jane. The worst stomatitis case I had was in a cat, um, this was years and years ago, who um, he, he was just so angry. Oh, my God. It was just unbelievable. Even the client could barely handle him, and I couldn't really get anywhere with him because of his situation at home you know he was smoking and stuff so it was just it's interesting i've seen a lot of uh a lot of the the oral cases that are just really angry yes especially yeah. and it's interesting you know it's interesting when you read mercurius and how angry mercurius is as a remedy mm-hmm. you know yeah. Mercur- it's got this it's it's a really pissed off remedy, and I mean, there's that really there's that really funny little rubric, you know, where the guy wants to walk down the street and grab people's noses off their face. But but as a remedy, it's a really pissed off remedy. And it goes from zero to to murderous in a second. To ninety, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Enough. You can just picture these cats. <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and and sometimes you can you know sometimes you can confuse it with you know again full circle with lachesis because you know we think about lachesis as as th- it's got that sort of ang- angry angry mm-hmm. lachesis and then we've got that loquacious lachesis and then we've got that depressed uh, introverted almost I I hate to use the word suicidal but but the, that really morose lachesis and but we see those things in Mercurius as well. Uh, we don't tend to see as much loquacity in Mercurius as we do in Lachesis, but we certainly see, you know, like you said, that zero to 60, uh, we see a lot of anger and we also see a lot of moroseness in that remedy. So I'm looking at Jeff's screen it, to see I'm not telling lies. Um, or it's fine mine loquacity. What are we looking for? Just a bigger rubric, I guess. So you have radar here? Uh, uh, yep, Jeff? that's okay. that's a uh, radar since some radar. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I guess Marcus and the rubric. <laughs> What, what, what well, rubric are you looking for? I'm in uh, liquesting. Mm-hmm. What are you looking? Well, it's huge. Yeah, it's a big one. Which mm-hmm. I'm surprised it's got a couple of mercs in it. So, but yeah, you're right. But certainly but regular that's... mercs not in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know either of those mercs. So it's nine o'clock. Do you want to? keep uh, talking do we have the questions or you know what do we want to do guys we probably need to we probably need to think about wrapping it up and right okay. so so for the folks that are here now what do we want to do next month do do we want to talk we do we want to talk about some case taking stuff do we want to do more um, um, individual case type stuff? Do we want to do more free free association stuff? 
Uh, I, I can speak being somewhat of a still of a newbie. I've only been practicing for like maybe like two years. Well, I mean, I've been a veterinarian for 18 years, but I've only been doing homeopathy for about two years. I, I, I'd love to hear more about cases, particularly where there may have been an initial incorrect remedy and then got to the correct remedy. Okay. God knows we've all got those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I see, you know, I have quite a few cases. I see that a lot. I, uh, I see that a lot. And I see that a lot uh, because I'm, I'm fortunate to share other people's cases too in the mentoring work that I do and some of the student cases. And, and there's some really nice cases where we start seeing, you know, even if our remedy isn't right at the first prescription, the response of the individual is going to lead us to the right remedy. But, but the challenge is seeing that response, you know, and differentiating, for example, medicinal aggravations from, from appearance of new symptoms and, and that sort of stuff. And, and that there's some, I know I have some nice cases of mine, you know, that we've kind of staggered through the bushes with. And I know that there's been some nice cases that I've read in the last, in the last while that show that. And I, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure we've all got those as we wander yep. through. Yep. And, and um, so I, uh, why don't we do that? Yep. That, that's a great, great topic. And doesn't, yeah, you know, Nikki's, uh, so the, Hus yeah, Nikki's got that really great book on the second on prescription. Second prescription, yep, that's great. Yep. So, and uh, and uh, Sammy H has written some really boring stuff about that too. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy H. And I'm sorry. Nobody reads it. Who was that? Who was that? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Like it's oh, my oh, old dead guy fan club. Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. but like like you said, but maybe presenting, because it sounds like what she was talking about wanting to know. So seeing cases where, yeah, there might be a, determining whether it was the medicinal aggravation or it's actually aggravation, a homeopathic aggravation that, that it's getting better, or, you know. Or no or, response. Or, yeah, or revelation of, of new symptoms that will lead us to the next remedy. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that always the challenge though, interpreting the response? It is. Oh shit! That's the hardest all. thing we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. For mm -hmm. sure. So, Lisa, I would say, in my experience, that it's much more common that you're giving a close enough a come and stimulating the vital force to make a new symptom that if you're looking for, is going to lead you to you know more yeah. curative, closer remedy. So yeah. That's, that's my experience too. You know, like the. The holy moly, the bells ring and the angels sing ones are far rarer than than the you know Will Will Taylor talks about this a lot you know like getting the soccer ball to the goal we don't mm. very often do that direct kick you know we mm -hmm. go down over here and they go oh wait a minute I got to correct let's go over here I got to correct and you know then we get to them in the goal good old good old zigzagging yeah yeah. Exactly. Oh, hey, I want to share before we sign off. I want to share about a book that I found at at um, Powell Bookstore in Portland, Oregon, this summer. I always go in used bookstores. I always go to the uh, the medical section and see what they have for about homeopathy and matter. The short story is that I was able to. F I found a book for um, the inscription said. Um, I forget what the inscription said. 1858. It turns out it was published in 1850, and it's actually a homeopathic pharmacopoeia. Oh, so, oh my God! That was pretty. Uh, yeah, because I was looking at it and I see, oh, it's 1850, and then I saw that it was a pharmacopoeia, and then I looked closer and I was like, oh, it's a homeopathic pharmacopoeia, and it yeah. was uh, wow, it was pretty cool. Not not very large. I was really happy. I was really happy when the bad banditos broke into my house in Pennsylvania and turned it upside down and stole shit and made a mess and everything. And I, my heart was in my mouth because I've got some uh, uh, 1860 uh, veterinary mm. books and homeopathy books and stuff. And I just, you know, of all of the stuff um, that, but they were still there. They were not where I left them, but but they were still there when I sorted stuff out. But yeah, oh my God. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what, I have a quick question about 
of Materia Medica. What Materia Medica? I know Kim Alia has used um, bladder orientalis in a couple cases that he's had. What Materia Medica has information about bladder? Because it's about not bladder. Yeah, bladder orientalis. Yeah, I think. And I guess. Yeah. B-L-A-D-A? B-L-A-T-T-A. Yeah, cut yeah. yeah. Blata. That's it. And, 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 um, and homeo, homeo info dot org has the proving and um, homeo the proving is uh, .org. H-O-M-I-N-F dot org. Remedy Blatta has got the proving. Okay. Uh, Alan, Alan has the proving yeah. in in uh, in in TF Allen's Materia Medica. Yep. He yeah. has the proving as well. And th although there was a more recent proving, I think too, because because there was a big issue. Um, no, it was chocolate. It was in the proving of chocolate because there was a lot of cockroach in the chocolate. That's the way it went in the chocolate. Proving, oh. Yeah. Ooh, chocolate covered. Yeah, yeah. but Alan, Alan, Alan's got it, and uh, and that other website. Okay. Has, um, just just ask the Dr. Grandma Google about blad approvings. All right. So that that was h o m i n f dot org was the first site, not yeah. homeo, not homeo. Remedy for the cross blada. Yep. Okay. All righty. that. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll sign off. Um, thank you all for coming, and well, thank you. Yep, we really Thanks, had guys. a lot of fun, so um, we should do this again if everyone agrees. You know, the same kind of open mic format, depending on how many, many people are there. So thank you all again. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Joletta. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your your experience. And Jane, we'll definitely um. Talk about all your the stuff that you emailed about it. You know, if not next time, we've got you know January. Okay. And and Jane, the other the other thing that I think we need to talk about is putting lycopodium in fireworks. <laughs> we already do. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah, I know you do, but yeah. I think that would be a great conversation. You could we could do lycopodium of all the ways. You mean you mean are we treating all the spectators when I have, we're, a, no. I have a whole tub of it? Not a huge tub, but it's it'll let maybe a quart, you know, of lycopodium. To make a green green yeah. green light when it when it ignites. It makes a flash. It it, it, it enhances the fire. God. Oh great. Oh, okay. it makes sparklies, you know. <laughs> sparklies. All right. Well fireworks this weekend. I'm looking forward to it. Oh. And then hopefully see some of you guys in what's that, North Carolina. North Carolina, that's coming up. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. I'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. Yep. Well, good night, all. All then. Sounds Thanks. Good, guys. All good right. Bye. 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 Night. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. That was really interesting.